This is episode 8 of the Wrong Fun Podcast, dedicated to all things science fiction and fantasy. Welcome aboard. We've a long voyage ahead, so we've lined up the best entertainment money can buy. Let's welcome our hosts, hailing from Oaks Colony, Sean, and from Broncoville Mining Colony, Ali. So sit down, strap in, and hold on while the captain fires the thrusters to maneuver the ship away from the station. Well, transferring to a garbage scow is out. Maybe Deep Space Ansible Satellite Operating System is available. Welcome back to the Wrong Fun Podcast. You're a wrong fan, and you're having wrong fun. I'm Sean. And I'm Allie. And together we're going to take you on a rocket ride in the science fiction and fantasy universe. So, Sean, how was your Thanksgiving? Uh, I was pretty good. I spent my entire ride up to Thanksgiving and a little bit of my ride back from Thanksgiving listening to Emma Newman. You can't beat that. <laughs> yeah, it's actually pretty nice. Uh, I, she is such a great narrator. We'll talk about that in a minute. Excellent. But, uh, yeah, it was pretty nice. And, uh, believe it or not, on the way back, we, well, of course, there was more driving than there was narration for Planetfall, but uh, I spent the extra, I think it was $2. It might have been 3 bucks, and I got the Brandon Sanderson Perfect State, and I, I got the audio for that, and I listened to that. So that was actually pretty good. I like the story. I mean, we know you know that. Yeah. But uh, I played it. My wife even liked it. And you know what? The, the ending didn't sound as bad. No. Again, you know, the second time through, <laughs> it didn't sound as bad. It didn't. It wasn't quite so jarring. Uh, I mean, because I knew it was coming, but it wasn't. You know, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> but I'm telling you, if there's not a second bit to it, somebody's gonna catch a stick upside the ankles. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> gonna have to hurt somebody. <laughs> yeah. So what'd you do? Uh, I just kind of hung out and uh, I cooked my very first turkey ever. Oh, wow. It was kind of fun. Okay. And it came out perfect. Oh, well, of course. It was awesome. It was a good day. It was mellow. Yeah, there was five people and two dogs at my parents' house, so it was probably, well, dinner was mellow, but it was still a long weekend, the whole family there, uh, you know. So, next week's book is going to be another novella. The Builders by Daniel Polanski. $3 at Amazon. Links in the show notes. A Missing Eye. A Broken Wing. A Stolen Country. The Last Job Didn't End Well. Years go by and scars fade, but memories only fester. For the animals of the captain's company, survival has meant keeping a low profile, building a new life, and trying to forget the war they lost. But now the captain's whiskers are twitching at the idea of evening the score. So um, I'm getting the idea that there's some animals in this, not humans. Yeah, I'm getting that too. We're going fantasy this time, not science fiction. And apparently it's grimdark fantasy. And uh, what I thought was pretty interesting is is I, I do look at the reviews. And there was a two-star review and it just was like second from the top and it was like the builders is incredibly violent and incredibly boring at the same time a short story masquerading as a novel the builders is incredibly violent and incredibly boring at the same time with no deeper meaning and no other goal than to entertain via mindless deaths exquisitely described the double revenge and betrayal story is nothing i haven't seen before the 12 year old me might have been more enthusiastic, but the mature me wants his few hours of life back. And I'm thinking, that's your complaint? Yes. That's a selling point, buddy. I can't wait to read this. <laughs> yeah, that's a two star. That's like, that's your five star review right there. I'm like, I'm all, all right. And it's like $3 on it. Yep, sell it to me, buddy. I am there. So there we go. Something a big change in gears. It's a, a little grim dark, a little fantasy. So, uh, ready to give that a try? I've already bought it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's already on my Kindle. So, uh, that's going to be for, for next show. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Sean and Allie, you have an incoming call on the Ansible. It's our guest, Emma Newman. Computer, what do your databanks have on Emma Newman? 
Emma Newman writes dark short stories and science fiction and urban fantasy novels. Between Two Thorns, the first book in Emma's Split World's urban fantasy series, was shortlisted for the British Fantasy Society's Best Novel and Best Newcomer Awards. She recently won the BFS Best Short Story Award for the story A Woman's Place. Emma's first science fiction novel, Planetfall, was published in November 2015. Emma is a professional audiobook narrator and also co-writes and hosts the Hugo-nominated podcast Tea and Jeopardy, which involves tea, cake, mild peril, and singing chickens. Her hobbies include dressmaking and role-playing games. Patch her through. Would he like me to fluff his pillow as well? Peel a grape? Give him a manicure? Buntian shung de yiduero. Welcome to the show, Emma. Thank you. In honor of your guest appearance, we managed to convince the computer to give us some hot tea. <laughs> there were some small misunderstandings as it gave us several variations of iced tea, both <gasps> sweet and really sweet. But I made the computer watch a bunch of old Star Trek Next Generation reruns, and now I've got something that it tells me is tea, Earl Grey, hot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Oh, well, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. My mother is actually Scottish, so I know my way around tea. <laughs> There's two kinds of tea, as I understand it. There is Earl Grey and English breakfast. English breakfast tea is my favourite tea. Though, I, you know, I can do a nice Assam if uh, the situation requires it. But English breakfast tea is my, uh, my favourite. Uh, and Earl Grey has always been my go-to. Yeah, Earl Grey, I have to be in a very, very particular mood for it. Uh, so I only have it like three or four times a year, very rarely, and I go, oh, I don't know why I don't drink this more, and then I completely forget about it. Emma, Ali and I will try to contain ourselves, but you are the host of our favorite science fiction and fantasy podcast, Tea and Jeopardy. Because of that, we decided that since your new book, Planetfall, came out, we wanted to read it for the podcast and hopefully talk with you about it. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Planetfall is my, I think it was the... A uh, seventh novel or eighth novel I wrote, but it was my first pure sci-fi. So it's kind of like a subgenre debut. And Planetfall is all about a colony on a distant planet. And the main character is a lady called Ren, who is the 3D printer engineer for the colony, which is an incredibly important job because 3D printing forms the kind of foundation of everything of life in the colony everything that they use is printed their houses their food everything so she's very important and basically this colony was founded by her best friend someone that they now call the pathfinder who had a very strange coma back on earth and woke up thinking that she knew the place to find god and turned into this kind of super genius and came up with the technology required to travel to this distant planet and managed to convince a thousand people to go with her. Ren is one of them. And all of that happened 22 years before the book starts. And the colony is at the foot of something that they call God City, this kind of alien organic citadel. And uh, the Pathfinder hasn't been seen since Planetfall. She went into God City. Nobody has seen her since. And then one morning, a man stumbles out of the wilderness. There are not supposed to be any other humans on this planet. And uh, he claims to be the Pathfinder's grandson. And his arrival starts a chain reaction that uncovers some very terrible secrets that the colony is built upon. And uh, Ren has to deal with this and she suffers from a mental illness. And so it's, it's all from her perspective. It's very different to anything I've ever written before. <laughs> it's... um. It could not be more different to the Split World series, which is, you know, very British urban fantasy. This is kind of like a psychological exploration, a deep exploration of a character with a mental illness, but also an exploration of the tension between science and religion and what secrets do to people and uh, how human beings function in very small communities. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm quietly proud of that book. And... Who's the narrator on that book since I got the audiobook? Uh, that's me. 
Oh, wonderful. So we already Yay. know the voice. <laughs> yep. You know the voice. Yep. That's me. Uh, I narrated that for Blackstone Audio. Yeah, I was very pleased to audition and uh, they said, yeah, great. Go for it. So um, yeah, I recorded the audiobook for them. That's I recorded all of the Split Worlds audiobooks as well. So I was really, really glad that I was able to do the same for Planetfall. It's one of the things I worry about when I read the little blurbs is that I'm going to mess up the names really badly. So at least we know all the names will be pronounced correctly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that's nice narrating your own book is that you don't have to go through all of the pronunciation checks and work out all of the ways that, you know, new words or particularly unfamiliar names are pronounced with the author because, yeah, like you say, it's all in my head already. The last episode we interviewed Marco Close and uh, the narrator introduced him as Marco Cluse. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, I have a, a fear that I will do something horrific one day. It was very strange um, having to go back into the studio and record the pickups, which are things where when they do the, the very close kind of proof listen and, and edit the, the book, sometimes there are lines that they want you to re-record. And they insisted I say GIF instead of GIF, which is mentioned in my acknowledgements. And I was there kind of twitching away in the booth thinking, oh, it's always GIF to me. And it was really odd having to say GIF. So, yeah. In, in the UK, <laughs> we have a bathroom cleaner that's been called GIF, for like forever, for as long as most of the people alive can remember. So when we hear the word GIF, we think bathroom cleaner. We don't think graphical interchange interface or whatever it is. I can't remember what it stands for. <laughs> a whatever picture GIF, file. GIF stands for. A picture file. I don't even know what that actually stands for. Yes. Yeah, the first word is definitely graphics. So I don't understand why the person who invented the format says that it's GIF, which is why the audio company insisted on it. Right. Um, but yeah, it's one of those weird quirks of narration where sometimes you have to say stuff in the way that you really don't want to. <laughs> well, we are two countries divided by a common language. Yes, yes, very much so. And that's always fun when you are a British writer and you are being published by an American press and have an American editor and copy editor. Because there were several points in the copy edits where trousers had been changed to pants and to a Brit, that's hysterically funny because that's underwear. And so I had to just keep, you know... <laughs> drinking lots of tea and in the end I had to write back and say look I can't I just I can't cope with this <laughs> Ren Ren's mother is is British so she would say trousers and they were like yeah of course she would that's that's fine and I was like oh good I was I was worried I'd have to have a big fight over this but yeah so <laughs> <laughs> so Planetfall isn't your first novel of course I had a no. chance to listen to your interview with Brent Bowen at Adventures in Sci-Fi Publishing you took a rather interesting route into publishing yeah, um, well, that was an interesting kind of rooted to the Split Worlds being published. I was published way before the Split Worlds. Yeah, <laughs> it's just when I look back on it and think, my goodness, it just took so long. The first things I had published were short stories. And then I had a young adult novel published by a micro press that no longer exists. And yeah, so the Split World series, uh, what I consider to be my first kind of properly published books, even though they weren't my debut novels, strictly speaking. But they were the first kind of proper traditional publishing deal I had with an established press. And with the Split Worlds, I originally was going to self-publish. I had quite an unpleasant experience with my, my first publishing experience with the YA novel. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to go and do this myself. And uh, so I, I kind of did loads of research and looked into it, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, thought, well, actually, if I'm going to self-publish this, I really want to do this properly. I don't want to just kind of rush off and do something that's half-baked. And uh, so I was thinking about this, thinking about the fact that I was the primary breadwinner for my family and that I couldn't just kind of throw everything into the air because I had a mortgage to pay. And um, then had a, an idea that with other, what's the word that I want, other industries, people go to venture capitalists with just an idea and say, look, you know, I'm developing this intellectual property and I need somebody to invest money in the business whilst this is developed and then hopefully it will make money. And I thought, well, why couldn't that IP be a world? Why couldn't that be a book? And uh, so I got in touch with a very good friend of mine who speaks this strange language of business that I don't speak and said, I've had this really strange idea. And uh, I told him over the phone, he was like, 
come come and see me we'll we'll sit down we'll thrash this out so I jumped on the train to London the next day and we were up till about four o'clock in the morning working out whether this was feasible and how it could be done and he he effectively kind of translated my kind of hand wavy author wishy-washy ideas into hard business speak for me and thanks to his help I went and got venture capital funding so I could stop my job and so I was able to write focus completely on the series uh, I wrote the first book I developed all of my marketing plan I had everything in place and then ended up going to a book launch for um, Adam Christopher who's a very good friend of mine and earlier that year I had recorded a short story for him and so I went up to his book launch and I think it was for Empire State if memory serves or it might have been the next one I don't remember and uh, so yeah I went to his launch and um, ended up chatting to people and I'd met Paul Cornell at a convention a few months before and, and he was like you know what have you been up to and I was like well I, I gave up my day job and I went and got venture capital funding so that I could work on this book series and he just gave me this look like what <laughs> it was, I can see it now he was like you, you did what and I kind of repeated it and he's like I don't think I've ever heard of anyone doing that and I was like oh really okay well that's what I'm doing and he said well the guy sitting next to Adam over there is Lee Harris from Angry Robot Books you should go and tell him and I said, well, I, I can't possibly do that because it's Adam's launch and that's his editor and it would just be so crass to go over there and say, me, 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 me. <laughs> so uh, I didn't. I, I, so very British. It was so, I was so British about it. <laughs> so British. And uh, then Lee left and uh, he missed his train. And so he came back to the bar. And by that point, it was like me and Adam and, and Lee by that point. And... Uh, I, I asked Adam if it was okay to mention it, you know, because the, the event was, you know, winding down and things. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. And so I told Lee and he, he gave me that look and <laughs> he just he said, I just, I don't, I, what? I don't understand that. So I repeated it and he was like, can I have a look at this book? I'm just kind of curious. And that's where it all started. And he ended up publishing it instead. So I ended up having this very stressful conversation with my investor saying, well, this happened <laughs> and uh, can we have a conversation about it because I think that this might be a really good thing for me and uh, my investor was very cool about it and said you know I, I kind of thought this would happen so we came to an arrangement I mean you know evil people don't invest in authors <laughs> writing a book <laughs> series so uh, it was it was all cool and uh, so we ended the agreement as it stood and uh, I went off and got published by Angry Robot so that's that. just <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was uh that was a strange time <laughs> it was uh yeah very busy very very unexpected and I went back that night I was staying with my best friend my late best friend and uh I went back to her flat and I said look the I've just had the weirdest evening and I've, I've met this guy who's the editor for this press he's amazing and he's going to read my book and uh, she looked at me and she said this is this is going to be a thing and this is going to be big and uh, so yeah now uh, <laughs> now it's all in the past it's done when you look back on things like that you wonder you know it was sort of meant to be but that wasn't that was hard work that was something you had to you had to make happen yeah I mean I <laughs> it was hard work and it was very scary and very stressful it was like having to learn a new language and a new way to approach thinking about things. So yeah, I did, I did make that happen. I mean, people talk about kind of luck in things. And the thing was that, you know, it was pure luck that I happened to be at that launch and that Lee happened to miss his train. But when he read the book, he loved it. And I'm a firm believer that you have to work incredibly hard. You can't just hope that something will happen. If opportunities do come up, you have to step up. You have to have something to show. You know, I could have met him in that bar and not had a book to show him or had half a book or, you know. Had a not, terrible book. You know, do you see what I mean? So it's <laughs> yeah. a, you see, make your own luck. Yeah, exactly. I see it as a combination of kind of working really, really hard so that if something lucky does happen to you, you've got all of the cards in your hand already. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was... Um, it was great. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, I mean, Lee is now at tour.com and, uh, and is, you know, off doing other things, but and is no longer my editor. But um, 
he's one of my favourite people in the universe and we're still incredibly close friends. And he's just a brilliant guy and I'm just so glad that he liked the book. But he loved the book. <laughs> Otherwise he wouldn't have published it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Tea and Jeopardy is, of course, the most awesome science fiction fantasy podcast known to man or chicken. Oh, you're very kind. It is. <laughs> Where did all the different parts come from? Did you sit down one day and say, well, let's see. I've got some singing chickens, a butler, some mild peril, and some tea. What do I do with it all? Or did it build up over time? <laughs> um, both, really. I, I don't have a butler. That's, that's fictional, unfortunately. Alas. So where did it start? It started, uh, I, I can't remember where I read it, but I came across something saying that an incredibly small percentage of voices in podcasting were female. And uh, I got grumpy because uh, it was like, okay, the thing that we see in practically every medium is now playing out in a, in a new medium. This, this sucks. There was only really two ways to approach this problem. One was to seek out actively more women podcasters and signal boost them as much as I can. And the other was to be one myself and put my voice out there to push this statistic in the way that I felt was more fair. And so... I decided to start a podcast and I had no idea what I wanted to do or talk about and um, I listened to lots of podcasts and there were a lot of very serious, very clever, deep discussions of stuff in SFF going on and they were in the dozens and I thought, well, I don't really have anything that I could add to that. So I thought about what wasn't there and there wasn't much kind of humour or lightness or whimsy. And I thought, actually, I think I would like that. I think I would like to make people laugh and to do something that, I don't know, I guess was kind of me and, and my kind of weird kind of quirkiness. I'm a huge fan of Monty Python and a bit of Fry and Laurie and kind of really kind of quirky British humour. And so I think that, that was a big part of it. And um, so I went and had a coffee with my husband and uh, kind of brainstormed stuff and I liked the idea of, of talking to somebody, but I wanted there to be a more creative framework so that it wasn't just a, a straight interview show. And um, we started kind of brainstorming off the phrase kind of tea and sympathy. And then I can't remember which one of us came up with Jeopardy, but it just kind of spiraled out from that idea. And I've always been a massive fan of the phrase warning contains mild peril on um, DVDs. <laughs> it just, <laughs> it tickles me <laughs> so much. And uh, I thought, I, I want there to be mild peril because it's the best phrase. So that was where that came from. The butler, uh, I don't know, butlers are funny and cool. And it's kind of like a pastiche of the stereotype of kind of the colonial British nonsense. And uh, so it was kind of like laughing at my own kind of former culture or something along those lines, kind of like laughing at the aspect of things. And I love things like upstairs, downstairs and, and stuff like that. So I kind of wanted to nod at that, but then have it that the butler's trying to kill the guests all the time, just because I, I think that's funny. <laughs> um, and uh, then as for the singing chickens, we had quite a few episodes. I think it was something like 13 episodes or so before the chickens came along. And they only came along because I was at World Fantasy Con in Brighton a couple of years ago. And I went out for dinner with a great big bunch of people and Paul was there. Paul is, is a very important part of my life, as you can tell, he's, he's kind of there at critical kind of plot point moments. And he was there at this dinner. And I don't know why or how it came up, but I suggested that maybe somebody should do a version of Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds, but with chickens. And I did an impression of what I thought it would sound like. And everyone was like laughing and laughing and Paul laughed so much in this restaurant he was weeping like really crying with laughter so I came back home and told Pete about this my husband and I was laughing about it and he said oh, we should have the singing chickens in tea and jeopardy I was like no it's just too silly it's too silly you know we, we're silly enough we can't go that far we'll be crossing a silly line and he's like no, no no we've got to do it we've got to do it and of course they're the you know the most popular bit of the show now <laughs> so he's always like you know remember that <laughs> i was the one who said they should be in it so uh, yeah that's where the chickens came from they came from um a theoretical war of the worlds version with chickens i adore your singing chickens <laughs> do they do parties events <laughs> Any plans for an album, holiday <laughs> special, maybe a special chicken episode in the future? <laughs> um, for last year we did a Christmas advent calendar um, and we're going to do another <laughs> one this year. 
and uh, for every episode the chickens did a different like Christmas carol or Christmas song and people were saying please could you do a Christmas album with the chickens <laughs> and yes. uh, so I was like no 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 <laughs> So uh, yeah, this this is not the first time I've been asked this. So um, <laughs> do they do parties? I mean, how can it not be a party when the chickens are there? It's automatically a party. <laughs> I know. It's uh, yeah, it it's a lot of fun. I mean, I don't want to kind of destroy the magic, but it, you know, Pete and I are the chickens, and when we record them, <laughs> yeah, we don't actually have singing chickens, and some people think we do, and and I just love them forever for for thinking that. <laughs> Because, you know, if I really had chickens that sang like that, <laughs> I wouldn't be worrying about money as much as I do. <laughs> I'd be touring the world with these chickens. I wouldn't just have them on my podcast. <laughs> so, uh, no, they, they're Pete and I. And uh, one of the things that I have to be really careful of when we're recording the chickens is not to look at Pete because he really gets into it. And he kind of like dances like a chicken. <laughs> 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 and it's the most adorable thing. <laughs> but I have to really not look at him because otherwise I just dissolve into laughter and, and then we have to just keep re-recording all the time. So I have to stand there with like my hand at the side of my head kind of blocking off my peripheral vision so I don't see him. <laughs> we have a very strange life. Oh my God, I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and of course my son now does it as well. He chickenizes everything. And so, you know, we'll be having dinner together and he'll just suddenly say oh you should do this one and then we'll like suddenly start singing I don't know Star Wars or something like that as a chicken so it's <laughs> like what have, what have we done <laughs> <laughs> Emma I listen to you and I despair <laughs> when I'm interviewing people I ask questions and I wait for a response and you just have these lovely conversations over tea how in the world did you learn to do that <laughs> um I'm British, darling. This is something which is, you know, built into me. Where there's tea, there's conversation. It's, um, no, I'm, I'm being flippant. I mean, we're having a conversation now. It's, you know, I, I think you shouldn't do yourself down. You're perfectly capable. <laughs> when you come onto a podcast as a guest, it can be really quite nerve wracking. And one of the things that I'm very careful to do is to um, have email correspondence with my guests beforehand. And of course, I have to break it to them just how silly the podcast is because I will tell my guest what the peril is going to be so they can give me their solution because I'm a firm believer that the guest um, comes up with their um, escape from the peril um, because it's kind of showcasing their creativity and brilliance. And so we've already had a very strange email conversation before we even have a kind of spoken conversation anyway. So it's a very good icebreaker to say things like, oh, and, you know, then the pirates will attack. What what do you do about that? You know, <laughs> once you've had to deal with these kind of perils over correspondence, it's, it's much easier. And then before the main part of the show's recording starts, I'll have a chat with them and make sure that they're happy with, you know, everything that's going to happen and uh, explain the process and put them at their ease. And uh, with quite a few of my guests, I have met them in person already, even if it's just very, very briefly at a convention or I've chatted with them on Twitter. And yeah, I just try my best to imagine that I'm, I'm being a kind of a host of a, an afternoon tea. And that's kind of part of the job is to, uh, to make conversation. So, but you know, you're, you're doing it as well. <laughs> well, you're rubbing off a bit. And actually, <laughs> I do listen to your podcast, not only for the entertainment value, but I listen to you to try to get an idea of how you do that. And I'm trying to model some of the way I do what I do on what you do. I got to learn somehow. Oh, wow. Well, I'm, I'm immensely flattered and quite embarrassed. <laughs> well, learn from the best. <laughs> So I'm looking at your webpage and I'm looking at the header photo. I'm going to kind of describe it. I see your books and I see the box with the dice and I see a puffin and it looks like a knight riding a unicorn, a tea set. It looks like a castle and maybe is that like a lighthouse? Are these like your curios? They are. They're all things which are very important to me. Tell me about them. I keep thinking, oh, I really need to update my header picture because <laughs> the, one of the books is no longer on sale. So, you know, that's that's the first no, no. You know, when it comes to like rules of <laughs> promoting yourself as an author, I'm, I'm rubbish because <laughs> this is massively out of date. But I really love the picture. I need to do a new one. Um, so obviously the books don't need to be explained, but the dice being centre is was a definite conscious choice because role playing is my 
my first love, obviously after my husband and, you know, blah. But in terms of hobbies, it's... Wait, 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 wait. Why blah? You've described <laughs> him. I've never met the guy and I like the guy. <laughs> I'm he thinking is, uh, this is like, he's got to be amazing. He is amazing. He is amazing. Um, Just from your description, actually, I got, love the guy. <laughs> we got together because of role playing. That's how amazing he is. That was what made me fall for him was his uh, his world building. And I'm not, I'm not joking. That is entirely what it was. And we met each other years before we got together. And I was his GM. But we were both going out with somebody else. So that's why the role playing dice are in the center, because I'm, I'm really really into my role playing and the tea is obvious that's my favorite teapot and the knight on the right hand side i went through a very bad experience a few years ago in uh, a work setting and i had to learn how to stand up for myself it was a really tough time and i was out one day and i saw this knight and i bought him to remind myself that i had to be my own knight i had to defend myself and stand up for myself so uh, he is on my desk I'm looking at him right now and that's why he's on the picture the little marble that is at the foot of the horse um, is a marble I've had for years and years and years and I just I love it I just it's such a beautiful thing and I've always had a thing all my life all my childhood as well of marbles which have got like sparkly swirls inside like other worlds mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's that really the castle on the far left hand side is made of sparkly sand that's been pressed into this castle shape and I bought it in San Francisco years ago. I was very very lucky, had an opportunity to go and study a summer school course at Berkeley and I went there and um, I got that in a shop in San Francisco so that's that was like a proper adventure that I had and I was so terrified. <laughs> I was so terrified I flew to America by myself. I look back and I can't believe I did it and so that's kind of to celebrate adventure. The lighthouse is made from serpentine rock from Land's End in Cornwall. I was born in Cornwall and uh, I'm very proudly Cornish. And that lighthouse was bought by my late grandfather uh, many, 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 many years ago. I think maybe even before I was born because he always loved Cornwall as well. And it was used as a doorstop um, to hold the front room door open in his house all of my childhood. And when he passed away, I asked if I could keep it. And that was the thing I could keep from his house. And so that is for my grandfather, who was immensely influential and important to me. And last but, oh no, 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 there are two things. The blue, the silky blue that you can see is a hat, a very strange hat that I made for a, um, like a course that I did, which was about um, oral storytelling. And we had to make our own storytelling hat to wear whilst we, told a story to an audience that we had to memorize and it's the most ridiculous thing that I would never wear anywhere else other than in a yurt in the middle of the Welsh countryside telling a fairy tale to a group of people but I love the color blue is my favorite color so that's why that's there and it's about the storytelling and the puffin is all to do with um <laughs> I don't even know I don't even know where to start with the puffin my dad bought me that puffin and my dad is awesome so that's the one aspect of the puffin the other is that when I was at university, I shared a house with a guy who really liked puffins. <laughs> and I don't know, he kind of infected me with this deep love for puffins because they're awesome. They live in holes and they have like a roundabout system when they fly so they don't crash into each other, which is very clever. And they have little babies called pufflings, which is the most <laughs> adorable thing. And they just look so silly and so serious all at the same time. And I adore them. And uh, when I was at university, we used to have this thing where we would talk about puffins and that they would say, go blue. And if anyone ever needed a hug or was ever in any form of distress, all they needed to do was stand up and say blue at the top of their lungs. And someone would run over and give you a hug. And this is in the, the role playing society I was in. <laughs> um, and that was all because of the puffin thing. So, And even yesterday, I had an email from a very old friend which just said blue in really big letters. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we exchanged e-hugs. So uh, that's what the puffin is about. I love that. <laughs> I've been to Alaska and got to see puffins and got to see them diving in the water. And they are pretty cool. They're amazing. And they're, I just love the way that they're so different on land and in the air and in the water. And they're just... Just the most perfect little slice of absurdity. It, they're just wonderful. So along the top of your website, your tagline is writing, anxiety, wrangling, and tea. 
I listen to your podcasts and your interviews, and you come across as very calm and self-assured. I also struggle with crippling anxiety, and I'm not very successful at it. (laughs) How do you do it? (laughs) Well, I'm shaking right now. (laughs) <laughs> I've I've learned how to keep it out of my voice. Very consciously learned how to do that. And I had to learn how to do that when I decided that I wanted to do audio narration. And that took a long time to figure out. So there's there is a practice there. Um and people say this to me at conventions because I I'm very open online about having an anxiety disorder and that was a very conscious choice that lots of people struggle with this and don't feel they can talk about it because society doesn't talk about it and doesn't make people feel safe enough to talk about it and so I thought a few years ago well I'll try and do a little bit to make the world feel like a safer place for people to talk about these things and the only way I could do that was to talk about my own experience so people know that I'm very anxious and then they'll see me at a convention and say but you look so calm but I'm like those ducks you know they look so serene on the surface but underneath the water I'm paddling so damn hard to Mm -hmm. handle it to keep a keep a I don't know a grip on myself one of the things that I always come back to is that I know the life that I want and I want to be a writer and I want to support myself with my writing and the only way to do that is to sell enough copies and to be successful enough to get more publishing deals and an element of that has to involve public appearances uh, which I find excruciatingly difficult but it was kind of a very a hard logical intellectual process where one day I sat down and thought okay all of these things are going to have to happen and what do I want more and I want that life more than anything else and so the fear cannot win because if the fear wins I don't get that life that I want and so now every time somebody says hey do this thing or come on this podcast or can you do this show or can you come and speak to our science fiction group My answer is always yes, even though there is a bit of me going, oh my God, and totally, (laughs) totally freaking out. Because if I say no, then the fear is won. And the day the fear wins is the day that I am not moving towards that life that I want. So it's exhausting. It is absolutely exhausting. Something that I think people who don't suffer from anxiety, I think they don't appreciate how tiring it is when you have to constantly push yourself through it. And there are days where I I am really just unable to do all of the things that I need to do and want to do. But over the years, you know, I mean, I I had my breakdown when I was at university and so I've been figuring out how to live with this for like over 20 years. Is it over 20 years? No, less than 20 years. How old am I? I don't know. I lose track. I'm so, (laughs) I'm nearly 40. So when, uh, well, uh, 20 years or so ago, when I was at university. So yeah, 20 odd years, I've got a lot of XP in this. <laughs> so I've been leveling up on how to handle it. And I've been blessed with having having met and known amazing people, um, one of which is my best friend who died last year. And she uh, she taught me a lot about compassion and care, not only for others, but for yourself. And she always said to me, you know, when you're feeling at your most anxious, you have to care for yourself like you would care for me. Because she also suffered from anxiety and I could be endlessly compassionate with her and I would hold her and cuddle her and talk to her and, you know, all of these things. And she was, she said, you know, all of the things you do for me and all the things you say to me, you say it to yourself and you do it for yourself. And that was some of the best advice I've ever had. So I'm very lucky that I was privileged enough to know her and to learn from her. So yeah, that's that's how I do it. It's it's a combination of patience with myself and I'm the least patient person in the known <laughs> universe. Uh, but when it comes to this, I have to just say, okay, I'm doing the best I can. The learned compassion, which I learned from Kate, and sheer bloody mindedness that I've I've got to do this and I feel the real compulsion to to write more and achieve more because I'm going to die. <laughs> It's as simple as that. I'm going to die at some point. And I'm not hugely convinced that I'm going to get to write all of the books in my head before that happens. So I haven't got time to let it beat me. So yeah, it's uh, it's hard and it's tiring. 
And I, I'm glad that uh, you think that I sound very calm. <laughs> <laughs> I find that really funny because <laughs> I am not. You come across as, as the ramp drops and you'll wander across the beaches of Normandy saying, all right, lads, put down those machine guns. That's just not cricket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of, I would love to be able to be that person. <laughs> I try my best to um, to kind of project this calm. And I think also when you have to do stuff in public, there are so many authors I've spoken to. We all, we all find these ways to deal with this because, you know, authors are like the worst people you could pick for, you know, just on average, how many of us love being on stage in front of people? It would be like, I don't know, 0.5%. <laughs> So we're, we're kind of this self-selecting group of massively introverted people who like sitting by themselves for hours on end, spending time with people who don't exist anywhere except but in our head. And then we suddenly have to go and be out there and be around lots of people. You find ways to cope. And, you know, lots of authors have a thing that they wear. They have like a particular waistcoat or a jacket or a hat. And... There are so many people I know who do that. And obviously I, I make my own clothes and wear them and they're like armor. So you develop lots of strategies. So yeah, it's, it's kind of learning how to do it, learning from other people. And at the end of the day, making myself step up and do it and, you know, putting my brave trousers on. So you're an author, a podcaster, an audiobook narrator, a dressmaker, a gamer. Is there anything that you can't do? Any other hobbies that we don't know about? <laughs> um, I can't knit. I can't knit to save my life. I've just learned how to crochet, which I'm very pleased about. And maybe if I went and had lessons for knitting, like I had lessons for crochet, maybe, maybe I'd figure it out. But I've never been able to knit. My mum, bless her heart, has tried to teach me to knit, but she's left-handed and I'm right-handed. <laughs> <laughs> My mom insists that knitting isn't all that difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's just no. So uh, I can't do that. Yeah, any other, any other, I don't have time for other hobbies. <laughs> I don't even have time for the things that I really, really, really love doing, like role-playing. I was just moaning to my husband this afternoon, actually, that there are so many great LARPs going on at the moment and I'm not playing in any of them and this is something that makes me very sad. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a hobby, but something I do really like doing is um, jigsaw puzzles. I find it helps with my anxiety. And that's something that I find very, very soothing. I used to like coding as well. I, I've done various jobs in which involved website programming and um, computer coding. And I really, really loved that. And I should imagine that most of the stuff I know is horribly out of date. <laughs> Um, but I used to love, love, love coding because it was such a calming thing. And, you know, you would write something and then it would work or it wouldn't. And if it didn't, it was because there was an error and you could go back mm -hmm. and find the error and then it would work. And there is just something so pleasing about that, especially when you're a writer <laughs> and everything is subjective and there is no right way to do anything. And there is no point where you can stand back and say, that is now correct. You know, it's just <laughs> it's just a thing you've made. It's not something that you can go back and test logically until you find where you screwed up. So yeah, that's that's something that I would consider a hobby now that I don't get enough time to do. Mm -hmm. So Emma, what's your next project? Ooh, uh, well, I'm currently editing my second book for Rock, which is uh, set in the same universe as Planetfall, but it's not a direct sequel, it's, it's an interconnected standalone. Um, and that's set on Earth instead of on the colony. Um, so that's the thing that I'm working on at the moment. After that, I'm working on something which is still super duper top secret, which I can't talk about, which I am so excited about. It's like there are fireworks going off in my chest. I just, I cannot wait. Um, but the thing I can talk about, which I am working on next alongside the other thing, is my Split Worlds uh, live role-playing game that's uh, going to be run in May next year in the Guild Hall in Bath, which I'm incredibly excited and terrified about. <laughs> Kate, who I've just spoken about, we, we were both very, very keen role players. And we ran a kind of test game at a convention a couple of years ago to kind of test out some ideas and kind of see how it would work. And it was a great success. And uh, the next thing that we planned to do together was a masked ball. Because, you know, because masked balls, come on. I mean, 
what's not to love yeah seriously it's, it's just yeah really everything is beautiful and really dangerous politically it's just like the best combination so that was the thing we planned to do and then she fell desperately ill and she passed away last October and so I thought well that's never going to happen now that's one of the 10,000 things that we were going to do together that we can't do now and then out of the blue a few months ago I had an email from a friend saying um there's a friend I have who loves your Split Worlds books and she runs LARPs and uh, she would really, really love to run a game. Can I put you in touch with her? And it's tot- she says it's totally cool if that freaks you out. And I was like, no, okay, we'll talk. And uh, she's called Katie, which initially really freaked me out. She's awesome. She runs LARPs. She's in a field as I'm speaking now which and it's snowing and she is out there role playing, damn it. <laughs> it's so, so wonderfully British. It's marvellous. So she's uh, really, really into LARP and uh, she's brilliant and uh, has organised these things all over the country. And so I suddenly realised that I could still make that happen for Kate. So that's what we are uh, working on at the moment. Um, And it's only, well, I say only, it's a lot. It's 70 players, which is, you know, fine for a live role-playing game. You know, when you're the GM, that's fine, that's fine. But it's uh, split between two of us. It's uh, it's going to be absolutely fine. But yeah, exciting times ahead. And the venue is amazing. It's just oh, oh Georgian splendor and um, perfect in the city that the books are set in. I'm desperately excited about it. It sounds glorious. I hope it will be glorious. <laughs> I really <laughs> hope so. I hope that everyone there will have a fabulous time. Thank you, Emma. I appreciate you spending some time with us. Any final words for the listeners? Oh, um. I don't know. Just drink tea and be excellent to each other. (laughs) All right, Emma. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You can find more from Emma at enewman.co.uk. That's E-N-E-W-M-A-N dot co dot U-K. A link to Emma's Amazon author page and her podcast, Tea and Jeopardy, is in the show notes. So that was pretty exciting. Yes, indeed. It was so awesome to talk to Miss Emma Newman. So unusually for us, both of us were available to do the interview. Which was awesome. Yay. Yeah, I got to be a fangirl. (laughs) Yes. Something that we neither of us discussed with her. I think that Emma Newman was the person who nobody noticed got robbed at the Hugo Awards. Having listened to all of the fan casts, Emma Newman runs the best fan cast of all of the people who were nominated. Oh, yeah. And Emma Newman did not get the Hugo. Yeah, and I don't think we mentioned that to her. (laughs) Well, how do you... Well, we did tell her it's the best fan cast known to man or chicken. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> right. So all we need to do is get a coalition of chickens together to sign up and vote for her for best Hugos. <laughs> that's all we got to do. That's true. Sign up all the chickens and we're good. <laughs> so there we go. Great fan cast. If you do not listen to T and Jeopardy, listen to T and Jeopardy. And right now, I think it's pretty interesting, is uh, she's doing the T and Jeopardy advent calendar have you, have you been listening to those? These little four and five minute shorts. If you're not listening to the TN Jeopardy already, it won't make even the slightest bit of sense to you. It's impossible to describe. It's just these little four minute shorts where she's talking to Latimer, her uh, butler. I mean, like, it just won't make any sense at all. It's, it's very funny. But if you're not listening to the main show, you won't get any of the jokes. But it's just so adorable. I'm probably going to listen to them on the way to Moab today. There's about four of them out so far. Yeah. She was threatening to do some sort of advent calendar. I didn't realize she meant that she was going to do it for the podcast. I thought, like, I was thinking, like, a real advent calendar. Of course, I don't know much about advent calendars, so. Ah. Must be more of a British thing than an American thing. Yeah, I think it is more popular in the UK. So, let's get straight into the book review. All right. The book is Planetfall. It's $10 on Amazon, of course, by Emma Newman. Renata Ghali believed in Lee Su Mi's vision of a world far beyond Earth, calling to humanity. A planet promising to reveal the truth about our place in the cosmos, untainted by overpopulation, pollution, and war. Ren believed in that vision enough to give up everything to follow Su Mi into the universe. 
More than 22 years have passed since Wren and the rest of the faithful braved the starry abyss and established a colony at the base of an enigmatic alien structure where Sumi has since resided alone. All that time, Wren has worked hard as the colony's 3D printer engineer, creating the tools necessary for human survival in an alien environment and harboring a devastating secret. Wren continues to perpetuate the lie, forming the foundation of the colony for the good of her fellow colonists, despite the personal cost. Then a stranger appears, far too young to have been part of the first planet fall, a man who bears a remarkable resemblance to Sue Me. The truth Ren has concealed since planet fall can no longer be hidden, and its revelation might tear the colony apart. So I guess something that we've noticed over time is sometimes the blurb doesn't make a whole lot of sense in reference to once we've read the story, and sometimes it does. I think in this case, yes, the blurb actually makes sense. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, this blurb actually makes sense. Renata Gali is British. She was born in Britain to a father who was from Ghana, and I believe her mother was British. So I think she's half Ghana, half British, but born in Britain. Mm -hmm. And I guess she went to school in Paris. So, and Sumi's parents were Korean, I believe, but she was. I believe born in France. I don't know. European. Yes. Raised in Europe. Correct. So pretty European, both people, but of multi-ethnic backgrounds. Correct. It spans some, like some pretty, you know, there's a lot of time jumping in it and it, it, it spans some very, very different times in very, very different places. So the, the entire thing is not like based on this, you know, future planet. And it all seems very near future, not far future. You know, it seems like day after tomorrow, almost. Well, I think it was sort of far future because I think there was a there was an overpopulation kind of thing going on, a little bit. Right. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. It's fair that it is. It you know, obviously, it has to be far future because you know we're not going to build a spaceship to go to another planet the day after tomorrow. Yeah. But you don't get this feeling that it's so far advance that you know we can't see it from here yeah but it's still it sort of feels like the day after tomorrow it doesn't feel like it's inaccessible to us true it's yeah it's not totally far-fetched and unrealistic yeah i think the easiest thing to do here is just to do like a good and the bad and the ugly so we should start with the ugly since there isn't one there's really no ugly here no so the good and the bad the good is is it's very well written yes Yes, so we kind of expected that. Yes. <laughs> another good was that another totally expected good is the narration because I listened to it in the car. I went ahead and bought the narration. The narration was fantastic. Emma, being a narrator, narrated it herself. And she has this cute little regional accent that doesn't come across really in her podcast. In her podcast, she tries to play like sort of high class. She tries to hit the received pronunciation, you know, Queen's English sort of stuff. She's actually, like she says in the interview, she's from Cornwall. And, like, that regional pronunciation of things, it comes across in the narration sometimes. Sometimes you can hear where some of the things in America, where the pronunciations, the, some of American regional pronunciations, you can sort of, like, hey, maybe that's where that comes from. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, you know, you'll hear people in America will say wash instead of wash. Oh, okay. Right? <laughs> well, there's one thing that she does is when there's a, a W at the end of a word, uh -huh. they'll, she'll put an R at the end of it. <laughs> I don't know that I could duplicate it, but it's something she does. If you listen to the narration, it's pretty cute. It, just listening to her, it's it doesn't ever come across as like uneducated. It just comes across as that's just like a totally normal regional accent, hmm. but it's real smooth, like f real smooth polished, not like harsh or uh, or uneducated at all. It sounds like real smart. You know, British people tend to sound smart to Americans. Oh yeah. It was it was an interesting contrast because of course the podcast we're used to her sounding like oh hello welcome to the Queen's Tea. Yeah. <laughs> and the other good was is that you actually care about these characters. Sometimes you wonder why, <laughs> but you do care about them. Oh, yes, very much so. And we have the bad. <laughs> so it's definitely literary sci-fi. 
definitely uh, a lot of internal monologue about Ren and how she feels about things. And Ren is definitely crazy. Yeah, that's not a spoiler. I think in the interview, she said that Ren's going crazy. Yeah. Didn't she say that in the in the interview? Yeah, I, I think It was she, a 45-minute long interview. I don't remember if, if she said it or not. Yeah, she did. She said that, that Ren has some issues. <laughs> right. So, yeah. I thought it was pretty interesting that it was an internal monologue sort of book. And Emma said that internal monologues you know that made up heavy amounts of a book were something that she didn't like about modern non-genre fiction Mm -hmm. Um, i got a clip that i cut from an interview that she did with the skiffy and fanti show that's interesting so so what is it about contemporary or i guess just like real world fiction that is so dissatisfying for you like what is it that doesn't work I think, well, I mean, it may obviously, it's not all of it because I'm not so ridiculous as to suggest that I have read all of it because that's impossible. (laughs) But certainly the things that I've come across, uh, one of the things that I really don't like about it is not very much happens. And there's a lot of navel gazing and a lot of kind of analysis of other people and themselves. And I have that every damn day. That is like my head. And I, I don't really want to be in my own head when I read a book. It's not just an escapism thing. It's a, a wanting to look at things differently. And so many of the kind of the straight contemporary literature novels I've read, it's like reading my own thoughts in many cases. And it's like, no, I have to be here every bloody minute of the day. Because I had the audio version. Mm-hmm. It started with the dedication. It started with her reading the dedication. And the the dedication was very emotional. Mm-hmm. And that dedication makes it extremely clear that at the time that the book was being written and being edited, Emma lost her best friend, like her closest friend in the world. Yeah. Her best friend that she speaks about in the interview who had serious anxiety problems and somebody that she apparently learned an incredible amount from and her friend dies yeah you think that probably had a lot to do with that yeah i i suspect that it's i suspect the whole book is very heavily influenced by all of that right so i you know we can hardly blame emma for taking what was in her head and bringing it out and putting it on the page exactly so what was in there, the internal monologue that she speaks about through two years ago, three years ago in the Skiffy and Fanti show, and you know what was in her head every damn day, as she says, uh-huh. and bringing it out and putting it on the page, you know, in some translated version in in Ren's ma- in mind, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's totally plausible for her to transmute it in some way and and let Ren deal with it in some way. I can totally buy that. I mean, that's it seems perfectly reasonable for her to use that sort of energy and and try to deal with it in some way in that way. So, I mean, you can hardly blame the woman. It makes sense. Right what you know, I guess. Yeah, that's, you know, that's what they tell you, right what you know. And it was very believable, certainly. You could totally believe, um, and especially listening to her talk about anxiety because you listen to her talk in the interview and you're like, this woman's not anxious. Yeah. There's no possible way this woman's anxious. You know, she sounds so confident. She sounds so so with it. And she's talking about it. And you're like, wait a minute. And then, I, you know, and then I'm listening to her read the book. And she sounds perfectly normal reading this book. Yeah. And then the story of the book. And she just nails it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> over and over over and over i mean like she's totally got everything down i'm like there's no way that this woman just was like some tourist you know she stopped by at a mental ward one day and like took a couple (laughs) of notes read the dsm a couple of times you know and she wrote a little bit about anxiety someday you know like this woman okay yeah i mean like i'll buy that she's got anxiety and she wrote about it (laughs) well yeah very 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 well yeah i had a i had a rough couple of days after reading it (laughs) i have ocd and it it 
it yeah <laughs> <laughs> it made my ocd a little kind of go into overdrive for a couple days <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but i didn't care for the ending a whole lot i i went online after i read it did some poking around and pretty much everyone that when i went and read some other reviews pretty much everyone didn't care for the ending and i suspect based on after reading the dedication and everything i suspect it's kind of hard to talk about the ending because we really can't give the ending away yeah but what other ending could there have been yeah there's no other way it really could have ended there's really no way to discuss this without being spoilers so we're not really going to yeah but there's you know come on now quit whining (laughs) <laughs> and if, if people are going to get online and piss and moan about something, then they, they go find something else to whine about. I mean, that's the way this was going to end. Yeah. Ren is what Ren is. <laughs> what was the discussion that, that Marco was talking about? You know, you, the characters and what they are and they don't, they have certain traits and, you know, they're, they, they they have a character. That's what the character is, right? Yeah. Right. There you go. Yeah. It ended the way it ended, and I didn't particularly care for it, and others didn't particularly care for it. And yeah, well, whatever. It ended. <laughs> <laughs> it was what it was. It was what it was. On that, you know, caring about everybody, the you 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 cared about everybody, but in the end, you ended up disliking everyone. Yeah, you kind of did. By the end, you came to believe, like Sarah Hoyt said way back in episode, I think it was four, that they were unpleasant people doing unpleasant things and dying in unpleasant ways. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) The bottom line on this book is, is that I think it has a pretty good shot to get at least, it's certainly going to get some Hugo nominations. Yeah. I think it has a shot to get on to the Hugo list. I agree. So you have a very good chance if you are a Hugo voter to end up reading this. I think it's a very well-written book. I agree. I really enjoyed it. I think it's in the genre according to the current definitions. I think we both enjoyed it. I liked it. I don't think it had any real action until like the very last bit. There was a little bit of fighting in the very, very end. Mm-hmm. Had kind of a sad ending, but mm-hmm. it, you know, if you're looking for an action adventure science fiction novel, this is not the book you're looking for. This book is like that time that you go over to this like new friend's house is somebody you really like somebody you you admire and that person they just put a, a lot of effort into making this really awesome meal and you eat it and you just don't enjoy it but you, you can see it the work that they put into it the hours of labor and you can taste the love in every bite you just don't like the spices <laughs> <laughs> you kind of feel like a tool because you don't love it as much as it deserves, you know? You just feel like, I should like it more. Yeah. And I just don't quite love it as much as I should. <laughs> yeah. You want to love it, but you just I don't... I do. You don't love it as much as you want to love it. <laughs> so, the only thing I can say is, is that I'm going to run straight out, and I'm going to get book number one of her split world series Mm -hmm. which she also narrated all of the split world series and she did say that this was very different this book planet fall was very different than the split worlds Mm -hmm. and so i am taking that to mean that there's like you know it's a different genre that genre is urban fantasy so i'm taking it that's different but i'm also hoping that there's like more action more interesting things happening yeah I got that impression that, you know, from the interviews that she's done on that subject, that there's more action going on. So we'll see how that goes. And if nothing else, I get to listen to her tell a story for a while, which is... You can't beat that. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. Even when nothing was going on, I was listening to Emma Newman for ten and a half hours. I know. Can't beat that with a bat. (laughs) That woman could read me the classifieds, and I'd... Okay, yeah, you just keep reading that. How much... Was that lawnmower you said? (laughs) You go right ahead and tell me all about that lawnmower. I don't need a lawnmower. Got a lawnmower. It was a good book. It was. It really was. It just wasn't up my alley, really. 
Yeah. So, yeah, Split Worlds, I'm going to give that a shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll let you know how that c- works out. But uh, if you're looking for action adventure, this is not the book for you. If you want a good example of what people are talking about when they say literary science fiction in that, you know, sort of a nonlinear plot, a interior monologue that's well written, this is a really good example, I think. If you want a good picture of what it looks like for somebody dealing with anxiety, this is a good picture. Yeah, that's also probably something worth noting as well. If you know somebody who deals with anxiety, that might be a good thing to read just for that too. Yeah. So, good on that one too. And if you are not subscribed to Tea and Jeopardy, you're totally wrong. (laughs) Yeah, you need to go subscribe to Tea and Jeopardy if you haven't. (laughs) That book was Planetfall by Emma Newman, $10 at Amazon. Link is in the show notes. The Wrong Fun Podcast runs on your donations. We count on you to donate or subscribe to cover our server costs and our book and equipment expenses. Making a podcast is a lot of fun, but it's not cheap. Please consider making a donation or subscribing. Go to wrongfun.com and click on the PayPal link. You can make a one-time donation of any amount or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly. It's a tiny amount from you, but it's a giant help from us. Thank you for joining us on this voyage. Music is courtesy of Simplify Recordings. Send your feedback, both good and great, to feedback at wrongfun.com. Show notes can be found at wrongfun.com forward slash episode eight. The captain has locked onto the station and turned off the fasten safety restraint sign, and you are free to move about the cabin. We hope you've enjoyed your journey with us on the Wrong Fun Podcast. Don't forget to like and share the Wrong Fun Podcast on Facebook. And if you've booked your travel today through iTunes, make sure to leave us a glowing five-star review. And remember, this show is powered entirely by your donations. See our website at wrongfun.com for details. This is a URS production. Random noise.